Hello in class. Hello online. Good to see all of you. Looks like we have the balance of the class is, uh, has changed. It looks like we have most people online now. That's okay. It's raining, it's raining yeah. How many of you online are online because it's raining? I am. <laughs> Good thinking. It's a convenient thing about it. Okay. Well, you know it doesn't make a difference to me if you're online or you're in class, and uh, I hope that, hope that that's more convenient for each of you. But uh, here we go. So when we left Wednesday, I let, I let it slide that I had no lecture for Friday. And yet I have, I'm here and it's Friday and I have a lecture. I had a personal best. Between yesterday morning and the very beginning of this morning, I created, I kid you not, 75 slides that I'm not going to cover it today. But uh, what I will cover today is the beginning of how we analyze uh, dichotomous item responses for uh, observed data. And in the process of building that, I realized that the stuff I gave you for homework I uh, probably won't be able to cover for a couple weeks. So I made the deadline December 2nd. So you get another two weeks for the homework. Um, you, I know that goes over the Thanksgiving break you don't have to do the work on the Thanksgiving break because you have all the week of the week that you come back. So I'm not, I'm not that guy who's telling you, you know, I need your homework due, you know, over break. I'm just not going to do that. All right. All right. Anybody have any complaints about that? Does anybody want to speed it up faster? Okay. If anybody wants to, I'll, I will point out your names to the rest of class and your emails. So the rest of class can contact you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would never do that, but that being said. Um, okay, so homework three is now due December 2nd, which guarantees it will be the last homework of the semester. Hooray, hooray. Um, the reason why it's the last, another reason why it's the last homework of the semester is there's a project. Maybe you've heard about it. Each of you submitted the proposal or project part one. Um, I just want to remind those of you who haven't booked a meeting with me to do so. Uh, to get started on how to do start analyzing data for the project, okay? And of course, if you have already done so, thank you, I look forward to meeting with you or it was great to meet with you when I did, okay? Any questions for me? Very quiet. Today is a two drink day. Right here. One being Coke Zero which when Coke Zero came out, I was totally amazed by it. Like a lot of people love the Diet Coke, but not me. I'm the, the Coke Zero person. But I heard this story, I don't know if you've heard this. The formula for Coke Zero is the original Coke, but with artificial sweetener. The formula for Diet Coke was the, the, the formula that, they, that Coke switched over to in the 1980s. They had this failed experiment. And they're gonna have a brand new taste of Coke and it lasted like, I don't know, a very short amount of time. Three months, six months, something like that. Well, that formula is in Diet Coke. So I like the old Coke. But anyway, too much. What I uh, would talk to you, where, we're, where are we at in class? We are, we just figured out how to do latent variable models. We used normal, obs normal data. Our data for class though, um, this conspiracy data are liquid items. They're discrete items. And we have models for liquid data, or for, for discrete items with more than one, more than two cho uh, choices. But they build upon the models that we have for two options, or what we call dichotomous data. So today's class is about modeling observed dichotomous data. We will transform our data into dichotomous items, which I have to tell you right now, don't ever do, unless you absolutely have to. But this is just for teaching. But we'll go through how to build models for dichotomous items and talk about the features of each of these models. Turns out dichotomous items, late, unidimensional latent variable models for dichotomous data, you might know those as item response models. You may have heard of them as item factor analysis models. So I'm just describing them with the idea of the data that we're dealing with. So we're gonna show how to estimate those. We're gonna talk about different parameterizations of these models. You know, I've been building models with slope-intercept form. 
Item response theory has a little bit different form. It's called discrimination difficulty. We'll talk about the differences and the similarities, how to do things in it. Well, how to, we'll then also talk about how to obtain what I call auxiliary statistics. What else do you get from an IRT model? Or what do you, what do you want from an IRT model? Those of you who took IRT. You might want things like a test characteristic curve, which is, well, I'll tell you what that is soon. You might want something called an item characteristic curve or a test, I'm sorry, you might want something called an item information function or an, a test information function. All of that we can get from these models as well too, but in a Bayesian sense, all right? Remember back in the day when we were talking about like R squared for each item? I always said R squared, you can't just calculate it, you gotta calculate the posterior for it. We can calculate a posterior distribution for each of the spots of a test information function, an item information function, uh, test characteristic curve. Anybody who does a, a, tr a theta score to true score kind of scoring method where you use the test characteristic curve, you can get a standard deviation around that score from it as well too. So all of it is effective in Bayes. And we can do it all at Stan with generated quantities. So Sound good? As you know, this will take a while, 75 slides. So I anticipate this will take all of today and probably most of next week. The lecture following that will be two different types of models. They'll both be for nominal response or uh, multinomial data. One is with an assumption of what we call a, um, proportional odds or ordered uh, categories. And one is that we have non-proportional odds, sort of a generalized logit model for it. Those will come after that. Then after that, I'll talk about different priors, different theta parameterizations, and then multidimensional models, and then we'll get into model fit. And by then, we'll be done with class. Hooray. I'm tired just thinking about it. All right, you know our data. There's the five-point scale. One thing I wanted to draw your attention, actually, anybody have questions before I begin? Still no questions. All right, anybody want to teach this class for me? It's fine, come on up. Give my slides, that would be great. No. Um, all right, so we have our five-point Likert scale. Just I want to make a note of this. We can't, these are not dichotomous data. I'll define dichotomous data in just a moment on a slide. But what I'm going to do is make these into two categories. You know all the items themselves. But I wanted to caution you at first. Do not do this with your data. Now, I kid you not, the Dino model, for those of you who are in my lab in my field is a psych methods paper. It's like my first paper. We created a great item response model for multinomial data, so a diagnostic model, and the reviewer said, yeah, just make it dichotomous. And being the very junior, just out of grad school person I was, I'm like, sure. So if you read that paper, it's all dichotomous items. Technically, they were polytomous items. They were built off the gambling data that you have for homework this time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, anyway, I do, I've done it before, just try not to do it because technically, you know, there, any type of recoding we're doing with data may be losing information that's built as part of it. So what we're gonna do is to make our dichotomous data by making an item a one if a person agreed with a statement. Now they could either agree or strongly agree. So anybody with a one is they endorsed or uh, agreed with the statement. Anybody with a response of zero is somebody who disagrees with the statement or is neutral about it. Or another way of putting it, anybody who doesn't necessarily agree with the statement. Right? Where doesn't agree doesn't mean they disagree, <laughs> it means they could be ne neutral about it. So it's agree or the complement of it. Sound okay? Okay. Now, once again, this is for teaching purposes only. We have models for multinomial data or for categorical items that have more than two responses. We should use those. We're gonna teach those, I'm gonna teach those to you in the next lecture. Um, the results here, therefore, I won't be comparing and contrasting with the CFA models that we did last time, the normal distribution responses, because we've just gone and completely changed the data, right? We're not looking at the data from the same lens. So with different data, there will be different results, and we can't tell how much of that is the different choice of distribution versus different choice of how we have imposed our data assumptions. Okay. So, 
thought it would be good to take a look at the dichotomous data. Um, here's the first item. I was just checking my coding. Yep, everybody who's a one, two, or three gets a zero. This is the zero and one on the rows are the new responses. Everybody who's a four or five get a one. And you'll note there are very few people in certain categories for these data. Yeah. I have two questions related to the sample size. Yeah. First of all, in this case, we can see that there are people in all of those categories. But what happens if, for example, we would have people in category three and four, and that's all? And the other three categories are empty. Can we collapse those categories in this case? We're going to have to, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It presents an interesting challenge because if we're trying to generalize our data, but we don't get anybody in those cells, uh -huh. how do we define the probability someone's going to respond into those categories? It's yeah. undefined. You can't, right? Great. So the first question is, do we, do we have a minimum size, for example, for each category? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> in other classes, yes, but for me, no. Okay. And the second is, uh, what is the minimum sample size for the, for, for the sample size here? Uh, again, no. <laughs> well, so think of it this way. What are we trying to do? What's sample size good for, right? Are we making inferences? Are we trying to estimate a model? I mean, I, I look at it this way. There's sort of hierarchies of sample size. There's, can I estimate a model? And for what I'm going to show you, 177 responses for binary data, yes, we absolutely can estimate a model, right? right? Do we... Um, do we trust the results? Do we want to make inferences about the model? Well, if we estimate our model properly and we don't have to tighten too many priors, we don't make it too subjective of an analysis, then the answer is no if we can continue to have the error that propagates in our posterior distributions present for any inferences we make. What's likely to happen if we do our analysis the correct way and we don't have a big sample size is that we won't have very strong inferences to make about things, right? You'll have very wide posterior standard deviation or very large HDPI, highest density posterior intervals around your parameters of interest. And because of that, you won't be able to say very definitive things about your data. So when you look at it that way, for what we're trying to do, we're building a measurement model. We're doing so in a Bayes sense. We can do this so long as we allow, like if we're going to, for instance, let's imagine our purpose for doing this was twofold. We wanted to examine item response items to see how let's say, discriminating or difficult they are, or how, you know, how, how very few people endorse them, let's say, um, which we can do, right? We can look at the posterior distributions of discriminations and difficulties. Let's say we also wanted to talk about where this assessment has information. Well, we can do that too, again, with the posterior distribution, but we have to allow for error to propagate through. And then we, we might, might, might want to go and look at people and their theta values, their latent variable values, and see where they are in order. But so long as we contain, like we allow the item parameters to vary, that causes more error in our distribution of theta, we will be able to recognize that as well too. So hope that answers your question. Yeah, perfect. You're welcome. Other questions? So this is part of my argument that uh, we always talk about psychometric models as being large scale, large scale, but the purpose, remember where that purpose comes from. If you are collapsing item parameters to their point estimates, you need large scale data so that those point estimates don't have a wide, what we would call posterior distribution around them. Like the more sample we have, the, more, um, the smaller the standard error or standard deviations are around those items, right? Why? Because we usually fix them at that point and estimate our latent trait. For us, I don't see any, any harm in doing what we're doing so long as we know, number one, a small sample may not generalize, and number two, there may be a lot of error involved in it. And so if we just note that, and mark those claims, and, and, and you know, don't hide anything that we're doing, I think it's just completely justifiable. So hope that helps. All right, any other questions? Okay, so one thing you'll note about these items that you might think is a problem. And actually, depending on the model you use, it, it kind of is a problem. Um, these items have very few people endorsing them or responding with an agree. The highest, the item with the highest mean or the proportion of people who said it, they agreed was 0.169. It 
the lowest value was 0.034, right? If these were educational measurement items, which, by the way, count how many times I inadvertently slip into ed measurement language and call this a correct response. There is no correct, re in fact, the correct response in this is probably disagree, right? These are all crazy conspiracy theories. Um, this is endorsing an item, if, but if these were um, cognitive items like a math test and achievement test, they'd be very hard items, right? Very few people are answering with a one. How are we doing so far? All right, do you remember the Bernoulli distribution? Bernoulli is our friend. We're gonna use a Bernoulli distribution for all of our models today. So let's, let's revisit Bernoulli just a little bit. The Bernoulli distribution is something that we would call a one trial version of a binomial distribution. You may be more familiar with binomial. So sometimes people refer to this distribution as a binomial, which is fine. I prefer Bernoulli because it specifically talks about binomial with one trial, so it's smaller. Um, the PDF, which in this case, because it's a discrete distribution, uh, probability mass function is sometimes called, the probability of Y being a given value, zero or one, is governed by a probability pi raised to the value of, the va of Y that's observed times one minus pi raised to the one minus y. And so you remember how this works. If a one occurs, this y term becomes one, the term in the exponent over here becomes zero, so this whole right-hand side in parentheses goes away, it goes to one, and we're left with just the probability. If y is zero, the flip happens. This part goes away, and we have one minus the probability as the likelihood itself. I'm just focusing on that likelihood function because what I want to do today is try to tie a little bit more of the psychometric model to the likelihood function. So I want to build this here because it is the core of what we do. Not only that, you've gone through a lot of, many of you have gone through a lot of psych psychometric latent variable model classes, right? You talked about um, the 2PL, 3PL, 1PL models. You've talked about normal OGIVE models. All of those I just mentioned use the Bernoulli distribution. It's the same distribution. It's just a different way of expressing the probability parameter itself, okay? Other fun facts about the Bernoulli distribution. The mean of the Bernoulli distribution is that probability, right? The variance is the probability times one minus the probability itself. Any questions on Bernoulli? No questions. Should I take a drink when I ask that? Let me see how the diet, or the Coke Zero, God, I almost called it Coke Zero. Oh, that's great. I don't usually drink that stuff anymore, but dang. I'm telling you, this makes IRT that much easier. <laughs> I, I do assure you it's all Coke in here, or Coke Zero in here, not other substances. All right, I wanna do a definition first. There actually is a slight difference between dichotomous and binary, all right? So this dichotomous data are data that takes two values, right? I say without numbers attached. It could be group A and group B, right? Two levels of your data. Binary data are dichotomous data that take a value of either zero or one. See the difference, right? So all binary data is dichotomous, but not all dichotomous data are binary, right? So for instance, if I said, uh, I'm gonna have a two or a seven in my data, that's a dichotomous item, it's not binary. But why do I mention this distinction? Because a, di a binary a Bernoulli distribution uses binary variables, right? If we go back to it, we're raising a probability to the power of a data. That power function only works when y is a zero or a one. If y were a different number there, we would have a not have an, an official, a standard probability mass function. It wouldn't sum to one necessarily, right? So that is the definition we're going for. So now on that note, most of your dichotomous variables can be recoded as binary variables if they're not. 
I could arbitrarily say that a two becomes a zero and a seven becomes a one. That works fine. I just have to change my definitions later on when I go do things. Not only that, if I'm building these auxiliary statistics, like, if, like for instance, a, a test characteristic curve is the sum of an expected value of each item response conditional on theta. That expected value that comes out of the model assumes a zero or a one, I would have to change that to be a two or a seven, right? So there, it's not a big deal to change the two, but just make a note, dichotomous is more general, binary is a type of dichotomous, cool? All right. So do you remember when I got through, we were talking about the generalized latent variable model course, right? Generalized data modeling. And what we had on the, I had the data on the left-hand side, and I had the model or the theory on the right-hand side. Do you remember what I always said about the data? <laughs> it's a function of the mean of the item, right? So we're gonna drill into that really quickly. Remember, a function of the expected value or mean, right? Going back to this, link functions themselves, we know the expected value of y is a probability, right? If all the numbers in our data are either zero or one, the average has to be between zero and one, right? What we need to do though is create a function that maps this mean that goes from zero to one onto the scale of the real number line, right? So for an unconditional model, the generic language I had, unconditional meaning just y, the data itself. Later we'll condition this on our latent variable or other terms. In that modeling equation I talked about before on the data side, the function is still not defined yet. The mean now is simply that pi parameter itself. Right, so what we are doing when we build a model is we're not necessarily building a model for the data directly, we're building a model for its, the mean. Now if you think about the normal models, the the, we use something called an identity link function. So the, the function itself is just a one times everything. And it looked like we were modeling the data directly, but what we end up having when we fit a linear model and have a line that line goes through the expected value of the outcome, right? So it is the mean that we're modeling there. It's the mean we're modeling here as well, too. Sound good? Is this putting you to sleep on a sleepy Friday? No. Okay. This is just getting good, man. I, if I do this at night, I don't go to sleep. I don't know about you guys, but in grad school, I used to work really late, like 4 in the morning. You got a question online? Yeah, I wanted to ask, what is uh, phi or phi, however you say it? Is that the uh, cumulative it is a distribution? Cum yeah, that's right, a cumulative distribution, correct. Okay. And actually, I have a notation mistake in my slides. This shouldn't be negative one up there. I'll get to that in just a moment, Nathan. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about this function itself, right? It needs to be something that turns a zero, something in between zero and one into the real number line. The function that we're gonna start off with is something called the logit or log odds. We've talked about that before in class. We take the mean, right? Divide it by one minus the mean. That term in the parentheses is called the odds, right? The odds of an event occurring. And then we take the log of it, the natural log of it, right? So that, just think about what's happening. The mean itself is between zero and one. When we take a, a parameter between zero and one divided by another parameter between zero and one, that result is something that's always positive, but it goes from zero to infinity. We take the log of that function, all the numbers that are between um, just a little above zero and a little before one are negative. The log of one is zero, and the log of anything above one is positive. So now we've been able to fix this, right? Okay. The other part of it, actually, no, I think my slides are correct on this, um, is that we could also choose a different link function, for instance, a probit function. The probit function says, what is, we are looking for basically the z score 
such that the area under a normal curve, a standard normal distribution, matches the probability or the mean of our item. Right? So what we end up getting out of this is a continuous variable that's, uh, that falls along the z distribution, normal. Right? And so this down here, this is the normal uh, probability density function. The integral from negative infinity up to a, a, a value is what we call the cumulative uh, normal distribution. It's sort of the, the proportion of data below z. That proportion of data below z, the value of z there is the term we use to model things with. Okay? So, we've got logit, we've got log. Any questions on logit or log? Have you heard of the log log function before? Or the complementary log log? We could choose to use either of these. All right, the log log function, we take the log of our probability, remember log of a number between zero and one is strictly negative. So we multiply that by negative one, making it strictly positive. And then we take the log of that <laughs> times the negative one, and it matches the, soul, the whole number line again. There's nothing that stops us from doing that. It's a little bit complicated. The curve itself works differently than a logit does, but we could do that. And there may even be places where this might be appropriate. I've used it before in data that are two choice forced alternative, like you pick a, option A or option B, uh, like in, in non-cognitive testing. You also have the, what's called the complementary log log. It's basically the same thing, but instead of the probability, we have the complement of the probability that goes into it. So each of those has a slightly different shape of curve. We could do this, you could use this. And in fact, I didn't include code in the back for it, but at the end of this lecture, you'll see code for all sorts of these models. The code doesn't change very much, but you could build your own function and have it. And in that regard, these are two other ones. There are other ones out there that exist. It's up to you to want to use it. So don't have to though. All right, questions? Why would you choose to use any of these? I think what it comes down to is convention more than anything else. In binary data, in item response theory, we're often used to the logit. It's fairly easy to work with computationally. Uh, the probit still sticks around. There's two reasons for that. Number one, historically, it came first. Um, Fred Lord's 1950 two-parameter normal ogive work. But then the second reason is that item factor analysis as a field makes assumptions about, normal, uh, the, about normality of the dichotomous response underlying it. And they use that to do effectively the same matrix decompositions on data. And so it shows up for that reason, too. But, Anyway, you also know that there's a conversion factor, right? If you multiply the term of the logit by 1.7, you get approximately the same results as you get with the, the probit. But we're going to leave the scaling constant off for this. Okay? Yeah. In other classes, we have seen that the log logit function can be useful when you have more ones than zero and complementary. Uh, or more than one. Is the same here? Yes, same here. We could think of that here too. In fact, we may want the complementary log log for our data. When we get to model fit, maybe we can bring that back. T try it out. That sounds good. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, I want I I wanted to ask a question. I don't know if this is gonna sound stupid or not, but no stupid question. Um when we take the log, like use a log link function, does that, if we try to integrate over that, is that a tractable, tractable integral or no? Uh, you mean the, the log or the logit? The, uh, I guess it would be the logit because that's the outcome. And so if you had a, if you, no, there's not a, not that I'm aware, there's not a closed form that you could integrate over this. And for that matter, there's not okay. really a closed form for the normal either. There's an approximation that uses polynomials, but not a closed form for that either. So the closed form means that there's like a, a direct way to estimate the in, the area under the curve. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Okay, that makes more sense. <coughs> yep. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Good thing the mask is on, right? Cough on all of you. All right. <coughs> Boy, Nathan, I'm choking on your question here. Excuse me. 
Sorry. Ah, there we go. Okay. Actually, it was such a beautiful question. I was a little emotional about it. So, all right, much better now. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just making light of everything. It was a nice question. Good question, you guys. Um, so, I had just talked about going from the space of zero to one, the data space, onto the space of negative infinity to a positive infinity, which I'm going to call the model space. Alternatively, we could go from the model space back to the data space, right? We just need a function that undoes the link function. The undoing, is the term we use for that is inverse, right? A link function takes, the, takes something that's on the scale of the data and maps it to the real number line. An inverse link goes backwards, takes something on the real number line and maps it onto the data, okay? So remember, link function, goes from data to re the real number line, inverse link, real number line to data. And those test characteristic curves, like for instance, if we wanted to map a theta onto an expected test score, we'd need to do that. So this was our link function, our logit right here. The inverse of it, if I just call this the logit of pi, inverse link, as you've probably seen, is e, exp to that value of the logit over one plus exp to the value of the logit. Now I put these other terms here because sometimes you see those as well. They're short of shorthand, they're equivalent though. All right? This term right here is equal to one over e times negative one, or e to the negative one times the logit. That's the middle term here. Or that whole thing can be expressed in one line as taking the, the term in the denominator and raising it to the negative one power. All right? So all those are equivalent. They're just shorthand notation. Sometimes they, they're easier mathematically to, to compute derivatives and so forth with, depending on how you build things. Questions on any of this? All right, so what happens here? We put in a number that goes from zero to, or negative, uh, sorry, number, something that could go from negative infinity to positive infinity, and it results in a number that goes from zero to one. So we've gone from the number line, the real number line, to the space of the data. All right, now we're ready. Let's get the latent variable models with Bernoulli distributions for observed variables. Boy, I think item response theory is just easier to say. <laughs> All right, we need a link function. We'll start with logit. In fact, for almost all the slides, with the exception of one at the very end, we'll use logit. You don't have to. Everything I talk about here will apply if you use log log, complementary log log, probe it, all of that. You might need some different syntax, slightly different syntax. And depending on the, the function you're using, you may need starting values that may be a little bit more in bounds. But other than that, pretty much everything works. So we're gonna start with the linear predictor from factor analysis, or the normal functions. Remember that? Mu i plus lambda theta. That was on the right-hand side. That was the theory in our last class, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna model the mean, sorry, a function, the logit function of the mean of a correct response, or a, a value of, a, of, a, of, a, of an item, mean of an item, otherwise known as the probability y is one. In education, we say probability of a correct response. This is not correct though, this is non-educational data. But we're gonna model it as a function of the latent trait, right? So this linear predictor, the term on the right-hand side, we often call this the linear predictor, it's the same. It's on a different type of data, it's on a different scale, but it means the same thing. So the theory, what I'm trying to express with this is the theory, the theory side of our model, right here, is the same. What's different between this and how we handled these data last week are the input of the data, right? So just think about what that means, right? Our theory is saying there's one underlying trait, or one trait that underlies the data that we asked. Last time we said, oh, the data are continuous and normal. This time we're saying, oh, they're dichotomous. Next time we'll say they're categorical and multinomial of some sort. Right? The theory is still the same, the data is just changing. This is the idea that I'm trying to get across to you about our psychometric models. They're generalized linear models with latent variables. Okay? So the other thing to note is in this shorthand, I've, I've sort of switched what goes into logit. 
I had said pi sub i for each item was its mean. I'm going to replace that with the probability y equals 1. And as we move on forward, we're going to have this conditional on the value of the latent trait. So once again, though, you remember how we interpret all this before, right? Before, the mean was the expected value of the item when the latent trait was equal to 0. Pardon me, the item intercept. Item intercept parameter mu, this thing, right here. We, that's almost the same interpretation. However, we have to remember the scale that we're on. This is the expected value of the logit of the mean of the item when theta is zero, right? So that's the key difference when we switch the link function to being something that's not just identity. We add one other wrinkle. We are modeling the logit, not the data, not on the data scale itself. This is not the mean of the item, right? This is the expected value of the logit when theta equals zero. Now, in factor analysis, when the data were normal and when theta was normal, this was approximately equal to the mean of the item response. And you might be thinking to yourself, hey, if I just transform my model back to the data scale, right? I just put this e to mu over 1 plus e to mu and I map it onto the probability, you might be thinking that's the mean of the item response, but actually it's not. In generalized linear models, that is only conditional on theta being zero. You'd actually have to integrate across theta to figure out what the mean of the item response is, calculating in that integral the transformation, the inverse link, going back to probabilities. So just remember that. It's a little bit different when we come to interpretation. Okay, questions on item intercept? Negative. Moving on. Lambda, we called this last time the factor loading or discrimination. This time I'm pretty much just calling it discrimination because I, I was in a hurry. Let's just be honest. And I'm running short on time, running short on slides. Same thing. It means the same thing though, although it's before it was the expected, actually it's the change in the expected value in this case, it's a change in the logit of the expected value for every one unit increase in, in the latent variable. So the key in thinking about this with link functions is we no longer say it's the change in the expected value of the score. It's a change in the function of the expected value, right? The change in the logit of the expected value of the score. So it just adds more layers to the description. But it, it really does function very similarly, okay? Any questions on that? So yeah. For scan code or building up the code for that, we, we do not input the item responses as they are. We have to transfer. No, we always use the item response, and I'll show you why in just a moment. Okay. Yeah, we never, well, we have to make the item responses. One thing we had to do is make them dichotomous, to use Bernoulli. Yes. But we don't do anything after that, and I'm going to show you why in just a moment. I actually had that, I struggled with that in grad school too, and I built these slides. Lisa, I showed the slides to Lisa yesterday. She's like, why do you have that in there? I'm like, I'll tell you why. And I'm glad you asked. I hope to show you in just a moment, okay? Okay. okay. Um, so depending on your field, what I just put on the last slide is either called the two-parameter logistic model with the slope-intercept parameterization, if you're in edge measurement, or an item factor model if you're in various parts of the social sciences, psychology, some parts of psychology, um, so forth. Now these names reflect the terms given to the model, um, and you'll note there is somewhat of a diverging literature in psychometrics where this happened. Specifically, 1968, I think that was a good year. I wasn't alive then. Sounded like a good year. No, maybe not, I don't know. Probably sucked. <laughs> 1968 sucked. But for Ed Measurement, it was pretty good. There was a, 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 a chapter by Birnbaum where the 2PL was expressed. This was, chapter was actually in the famous Lord and Novick book. Novick, by the way, was a faculty member here at Iowa. For those of you who, who work in my lab, his office was 
224B1, which used to be my first office here. So some of you might even be working in his office. So just as you know. That. Second, so that is the two parameter logistic model. The other one, um, I believe, I think it probably started before this, but probably the most um, notable original source is uh, Christofferson's 1975 paper, Factor Analysis of Dichotomous Variables in Psychometrica. Um, Christofferson, I believe, was advisor to Bank Mutane. Bank Mutane created M. Prior to M, there was a program called LizComp. It does limited information versions of factor analysis. Um, there are other limited information versions that are out there, one by uh, the person I had noted before, Rod McDonald, in a program called No Harm, which you can find on the internet places, but hard to track down these days. Uh, uses, uh, well, a slightly different version of limited information methods to do things. And here's the fun thing between these two families of models. Estimation methods are largely the biggest difference. So when we throw Bayes in here, Bayes is an estimation method. Uh, particularly Markov chain Monte Carlo is a specific estimation method for Bayes. So when we look at these two models in a Bayesian lens, there's very little difference between the two. There will be subtle differences, and I'm going to show you those in just a little bit. But I mention this to you because if you know one of these fields better than the other, that's fine. It sort of uh, multiplies what you know about the other field. Every time you can link a psychometric model to something you already know in your brain, you can unlock that part of what you know about statistics and apply it to the specific model that you're using. It's a really good thing. So, questions on that? Has anybody read the chapter in Lord and Novick? Or the, the paper by Christofferson? I do recommend them if you have a chance. The Lord and Novick book um, still has a lot of features that are interestingly relevant. It's probably because they really started leading the, uh, the field in certain ways back then. But, okay. So let's talk a little bit about how this differs from a normal distribution. The normal distribution we did last week, right? Remember the normal distribution model for an item, there's our same linear predictor. So this is the mean of the item response. But then we also had this error term over here that we said was normally distributed with some uh, unique variance is how I parameterized this. We had to put it as a unique standard deviation in STAN. Remember that? Our logit model has the same linear predictor, but there's no error variance to it. And the reason for that is the Bernoulli distribution, you only have one parameter. You have the mean, pi. Right? The variance in Bernoulli is a function of the mean. Alternatively, if you really wanted to do things backwards, <laughs> you could define the variance parameter and then the mean would be a function of it. But the, why I'm making this point to you is the Bernoulli distribution only has one parameter. So there's only one parameter we can model when it comes to building a model with a Bernoulli distribution, right? The same thing goes if you are in any other type of data. Next week we'll have discrete data that are more than two categories. And we'll have a few more parameters, but none of them will be variances. The variance will be conditional on those parameters or better yet than we're putting it, if you know the mean, you know the variance. And the next week we'll have several means. If you know those means, you know the variance. But either places, you don't have error. There's no place for error. In other fields, if you really wanted to know what the error is, the, the error term in this case would actually follow a logistic distribution. And the variance of it would be fixed up to a scaling constant. Usually that constant gets set to one. So if you're in Lisa's classes, you might have heard the term pi squared over three as variance in logistic. That's what's happening there. It's locked in, it's fixed. And why it's fixed is because the distributional assumption does not have a spot for variance. Okay? So if you're coming off of this saying the models are effectively doing the same thing, which I'm arguing for, you have to remember there are some subtle differences in each of the distributions that we have. Before we had error, we just basically saturated the error variance, called it, have it, had its own parameter. But now, otherwise, we don't have it. So, so the identity link function was the other part of it, right? 
Here in the normal model, the mean, the expected value of y given theta, is on the data scale, right? Because we're assuming, when we assume theta follows normal distribution and error follows normal distribution, we sum two normals together. Remember, the range of the normal distribution is the real number line already. We t add two numbers that have that same range together. The outcome y has to follow that. So we're already on that scale of the real number line. We don't have to do any link transformations. So what we call this is an identity link function, meaning the mean time is the mean times one effectively, it's itself. Okay. So the model scale and the data scale when you use a normal distribution are the same. Right? You don't have to transform the mean. When you look at our data, the link transformation, the logit, puts us into a different scale. We're on a model scale now. We're on logits for most of our model parameters. In fact, almost all of our model parameters. The exception being when we add like a C parameter in IRT, which is a probability. Um, so the model scale is different from the data scale. That's the main thing to think about. Questions on this? Is this helpful, trying to put all the, the math into place? Okay. All right, so often when you, actually when you're in IRT world, you often see the model expressed looking like this, right? Which is fine. It's the same model, it's just on the left-hand side where we have the data scale. And the right-hand side we have the inverse link function. And within the exponent is the logit. So the model scale is up here in this exponent itself. The models are equivalent, right? One is talking about it from the logit side, like previous slide. This is the model scale on logits. This is saying, oh, put those back to the data scale. I, I want to think about data for probabilities, right? So it's just a matter of reference, okay? Also, just like in the normal data, the CFA in our Bernoulli data model, we had, remember we had coded all of our items. Actually, this should be the probability y equals one, but my apologies. Um, We'd coded all of our items, one through 10, to be binary. So I, we, we still have 10 separate simultaneous now logistic regressions that we're trying to estimate. Each one has a separate mean. Each item has a separate mean. That's the term in here. I'll, I should have had the probability for each, but I, it actually took about 25 minutes to compile the data and my slides, so I'm not gonna change it. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have things fall off the rails even more than they already have. Um, but yeah, 10 different equations. This makes sense, right? Remember what we're doing is simultaneous analysis of 10 different items all at once. In another class, you'd call this a path analysis or a multidimensional regression model. Any questions? No. Got to be careful with the caffeine, man. I can feel the energy's getting amped up. Here comes the good part, the part that Lisa hated. Remember our analysis steps for measurement models? I just wanted to refresh your memory. Up to this point, we've done number one. We specified the model. The next part, we're just gonna do what we did before, standardized latent variable. Once I get through all the different item types, we'll switch that up. And then step three is we'll estimate the model in this lecture. After that, we'll see where we get. So, so once again, we just specified the model. We are now assuming that theta follows a normal distribution with a mean of zero variance of one. By the way, if you read some of the Bayesian texts on this, like the Levy and Miss Levy book, Jean-Paul Fox's book, they talk about how we like to put a mean here in the theta part, or we like to put a variance here and just estimate it. And I'll tell you about more about that when we get past all the item models. I don't like that prior. There's a reason I don't like that prior, and part of that reason is when we do it that way, not following psychometric conventions, the mean borrows information from each person, meaning the prior for an individual now depends on other individuals. It's like saying, Vladimir, when you take a test, your score is going to in part going to depend on how Ahmed did in the test also. I don't think that that's a very nice thing to do, personally. I guess it sort of does. I mean, you think of, never mind. Getting down the rabbit hole. All right, so let's talk about likelihood functions now. And this is the answer to the question of why we don't transform our data. Okay, 
So I'm going to take, when we specify the model, remember just like before, the model specifies, remember in the posterior distribution, pop quiz, what, are the two, what is the uh, posterior distribution proportional to? Prior, prior, sorry, Shefton. Likelihood of the data, likelihood of the prior, the product of those two, right? So the model itself <coughs> is giving us the likelihood of the data. So if we were to look at the likelihood of the data conditional on, let's say, one parameter, lambda one, right? So when you build a Markov chain, in each iteration, you may sample parameters separately from each other, so long as each gets the chance to be sampled in that iteration. So what we could talk about is taking just lambda one, so it's the, the factor loading or discrimination for the first item. Imagine you're in the, like, one of the iterations, and in that iteration, you already have people's scores for theta, because you have a sampled value for it, and you have the sampled value for mu for the item, right? So conditional on all those other terms. I want to look at the likelihood of lambda 1 holding mu and lambda con or theta constant. So building this likelihood is the following, right? The likelihood function we all saw before, this is Bernoulli, there's our Bernoulli. But the likelihood itself is a joint likelihood and the beginning part, this product, is taken across all people, right? This is an item likelihood. So every person's data invo is involved in that item likelihood. Because we assume people are independent, we take the product of their prob probability mass functions for all the people. With me so far? Okay. Now, we often work with a log likelihood because those pro that product of, very, of those probabilities can lead to a very small number that gets in the way of numerical stability, kind of our precision in our computer. So that product actually turns into a log usually. Just, and so when we take a, a log of a product, it becomes the sum of the logs of that product. But here's the key. The data have to be their original values of 0 and 1 because that's what's in the likelihood function taken to the exponent. Where the model parameters go is it replaces the probability. And it replaces that probability for each person. Right? So conditional on a person's theta and the mu, we would calculate a probability for a given value of lambda 1. That, la that probability shows up in the likelihood function. The likelihood function either expresses that as the log of the probability, if the uh, item response was a 1, or the log of 1 minus the probability if the item response was a, uh, was a 0. Does that make sense? If you want to see this in syntax, Good luck for me finding it. I have like 1,200 lines of code. Seriously, I was busy yesterday. Let's go up here. All right, so here, there's our mu. I'm just gonna randomly just say mu is negative two. Why did I pick negative two? Remember the first item had a probability, a marginal probability of 0.16. So we know mu is the log, the logit of the probability when theta is zero. So it's going to be very small, right? It's going to be a small probability. I randomly just fix some values of theta. So mu is negative two. I have 177 people. There's their random values of theta. Just pretend this is like the initial step in the algorithm with random starting values. What I want to do is I want to try out or build a likelihood function across a sequence of lambda values. So basically, I'm going to calculate the, the log likelihood for the data for every one of those lambda values. Okay. And here's how it goes. I'm going to start the very first value. Lambda, the very first lambda is negative 2. Probably not likely, but we've got to try it. So what do I do? I take my value of mu, my value of theta, and my proposed value of lambda, and I form the logit for everybody, right? This is the, the data scale, the linear predictor on the data scale for each person. Now I want to convert that into probabilities, right? So I take e to that logit over 1 plus e to that logit. And now what this is telling me is this is each person's expected item response probability, or probability of answering with a 1, 
conditional on their theta, the mu at that step, and that first value of lambda. So now I need to take, so this right here, this probability is that term right there. The probability for each person, P, for that first item. With me? Okay. So, turns out in R, the D binome function will calculate the function that I'm looking for right here, right? We have to tell it the item response. Here I'm giving a vector of item responses. The size, well this is a, the number of trials in a binomial, and we know Bernoulli is one trial. We tell it the probability for each of those responses. So the, this is a vector, a vectorized function, right? The, the probabilities have to match the same size of the data. And then I'm gonna tell it the log is true. So in here, this term for each person represents the highlighted part or the shaded part of the, of the equation right here. It's the log of their probability of a correct response evaluated whether or not they have a value of one, excuse me. So, so for instance, person one answered with a zero, their probability was 0.2. Because they answered with a zero, the value of the log, the logit for them, negative 0.22, is actually found by one minus their probability. The log of one minus their probability. Or if you really want to see how that works, just slow the code down just a bit here. We take one minus that, we take the log of this, and we get the negative 0.22 that we see in their value of the logit, right? But we need to sum across all those logit values to get the, the, the joint log likelihood. That's where the sum comes in. So the joint log likelihood, or the height of our log likelihood for the data at that value of lambda is now 100, negative 134.7619. Have you done this before? Okay. So this is new to you. Sweet. So I do this for all everybody. And now I have all my lambdas, but I also have a log likelihood as such for each, right? Remember, every one of those values of lambda, I have the same set of theta as the same mu. I'm just varying lambda to show its log likelihood, right? And here, of course. <laughs> You know what, let's go back here. I have it in the, in the slides. There it is. That's our log likelihood. All right? So what is that doing in our Bayes analysis? Right? Stan is using the log likelihood in trying to figure out, as, as a core, in trying to figure out whether a parameter stays the same or switches in each iteration. So Stan will suggest one value of lambda. We have the previous iteration's value of lambda. We take each one's height or their log likelihood. We factor in not only the prior distribution for it, but we also factor in the probability attached to how likely it was that a proposed value was drawn. And stochastically, we choose between the two with a random chance that we jump. That's how it works. So we don't transform our data what we end up doing is transform our model parameters to give us onto the data scale. So that's the answer to that question. How's that, does that work? Yeah. Any other questions about this? I struggled with that too when I was in grad school. As did Lisa, I remember talk, talking to her right after grad school about this. All right, you wanna do the same for theta? Theta you might have played with before. In any of your IRT classes did you have to calculate like the MLE of a, a theta before, all right? Do you remember that vaguely? I see some nodding, all right. What do we do for theta? The likelihood for theta, the data likelihood for theta, now does not go across people, but we assume that item responses are, are independent, conditional on the value of theta, the conditional assum uh, appendant, ind uh, independence assumption. So each item now varies. So what we would need to do 
to look at theta, here is we'd need mu's for every one of our items. We'd need lambdas for every one of our items. We pick a person and we set some values of theta. I'm picking thetas between, between negative three and three. We can go further if we wanted to. And now we, we loop across each item. Again, for each value of theta, right? so if parameter is one, we are testing out the value of theta of negative three. Now we have to build this, we have a double loop here because we not only have to loop across all the, the items, we have to actually loop across, pardon me, not only the loop across all the values of theta that we're trying, we have to loop across each item because the item response likelihood is built on that person's pattern of data. So now we comp compute a logit, oops. The logit now is the for, for the very first item. We compute a probability, oops. There's a probability of that logit. And then again, we use that dbinome function to make that work. So if I do this for everybody, you can see the result. This is the log likelihood. This is actually person two's log likelihood. So given this set of item parameters, the most likely value of theta for this person is somewhere over here. But remember, we're not interested in most likely we use this to help determine whether we want to keep theta from that iteration or switch to a new one. This is the Markov process that defines the Markov chain. Right? Likewise, you can see what happened for theta one. That's a problem. In a maximum likelihood sense, we would call this a problem, right? Because the likelihood is strictly increasing or, or increasing as theta goes negative. Do you have any idea why this person has a a likelihood that looks like this? Yes, no. They have answered. This is a person. Person one in our data. Actually, no, let me go to the environment. Maybe. Person one answered all items with a zero. That is one of the, in ML, if we were doing ML and trying to find a maximum for theta, that is one of the values of the, one of the cases where a maximum doesn't exist. But that's okay for us in days for two reasons. Number one, the contribution to figuring out whether we should keep this data or switch, the, the data are only one contribution to it. We also have the prior as well. And we also have the transition uh, probability. So how are we doing with all this? If this doesn't make your Friday good, like your weekend is just going to be amazing after this, right? Any questions on the math behind it? You want to see how to do this in Stan? All right. Let's take a look at the model block. The key in doing this is a function called Bernoulli logit. Turns out Bernoulli logit really only applies to the one and two parameter logistic functions. There's a more general version that's at the end of the slides, but I'm using Bernoulli logit because if you can use it, it's really nice, All right? What it does is takes your linear predictor, uses a logit, inverse logit transform to put it back into probability, and then puts that into the Bernoulli PDF, PMF, like we had just done in our previous examples, okay? So Bernoulli logit is how we make it work. You'll note, this part of my syntax is identical to last time, right? The item, the only thing that changes, we change the items itself. Now, there's a little bit more of a change. Turns out, to use Bernoulli logit, the data have to be defined as an integer which is a variable type that's very different than a real number. Right, an integer can only take discrete numeric values. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Technically, Bernoulli needs an integer that has either a zero or a one. Previously in our data step, we used a matrix to define why our data. And when we use a matrix, it defaults to being a real number, meaning a value can take numbers that are not just the discrete integers themselves. So 1.2, for instance, is an example. 
by the way. The parameters block is no different. The only difference is that there's no, no side parameters, right? That's, that's basically it. But the data block is where things show up differently. To define an integer, wouldn't you know, you can't use a matrix. You can't use a matrix because matrices are reserved for real numbers. You can use a two-dimensional array. So it turns out, in the real world, an array, a matrix is a type of array. Array is like the general statement. Like the list object in R is an array that's just irregular in its shape, right? In Stan, an array can have any number of dimensions. So here we have two dimensions. We have something for items and something for people. When we define an array, we can call it an integer. And so we do that. And we actually tell it the lower bound is 0, upper bound is 1. This actually gives us a check on our data when we input it, import it into Stan. Because if some of our data aren't 0 or 1, it'll say, hey, wait a minute, there's a problem. This is good. Now, the one last complicating factor is this. The order of the data have switched. When you use an array in Stan, it goes, it's called something that is a row major, which meaning the, the first index is the thing to loop over. So when I built my loop across items here, this is called vectorized code. I didn't make a loop across people. I, to loop across items, they have to appear first in the array. So the data that we're putting in to Stan for this model is our original data frame, but transposed. So now every row is a different item, and every column is a different person. So before we had 100, you know, remember we have 10 items, 177 people. Last week we used a matrix. That matrix was sized 177 rows, so each person in a row, and 10 columns. This is the flip of that. 10 columns and 170, sorry, 10 rows and 177 columns. So once again, this array has 10 rows, 177 columns. So if you, if you are sure that the, the data is 0, 1, so can, can you use the matrix instead of array? No. Okay. No, the matrix itself only lets it be real valued. And if you try to use the Bernoulli logit or a Bernoulli distribution with a real valued number, it throws all sorts of error. It says, I expected it to be, and it gives you all the types, array, row vector, all sorts of things, right? So technically, when I go back and teach this class the next time, if I get the chance to teach this another time, I'll go modify my normal distributions outcome to use an array also, because we can still use it that way too, mm -hmm. to make it consistent. Any qu other questions on that? So the other part of this is we have to transpose our data. So in this data step where we build our list of data that gets imported into Stan, this T function is called a transpose. We can use it with a data frame or a matrix, right? All it does is it just takes the data frame and swaps the rows for the columns, right? It's like taking a rectangular box of data that's very long and making it rectangular but very wide. Right. Everybody good with that? Sweet. After that, look at this. This code looks almost the same. You will note though my initialization function. What's that do? Anybody remember from last time? That's right. We had last time issues with convergence I always remember that plot, the x, right? This is putting our factor loading or discrimination parameters very positive. I've changed the number, though, from 10 to 5. And the reason for that is, remember, we have to take, when we build this model right here, this is the linear predictor it needs to go into the inverse length function, which means it needs to go into an exponent function, or it needs to be e raised to this power. Turns out, when you have floating point numbers, there's only 
there's a maximum number that you can save. And E, or Euler's constant, 2.71, whatever it is. I think it's 2.71, right? 718. <laughs> 718, thank you. That's close. 718, you said? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. I got it. 72. Okay. 718, thank you. Um, when you raise that to a number, if you raise that to a power when you have um, already have the number 5 there, it doesn't take a, a very large theta before numerically you cannot evaluate that number. It becomes not a number. It exceeds the numerical precision of your machine. So if you put a 10 here, there will be some cases at the beginning where it cannot evaluate a likelihood because it's not a number. Right? Have you ever seen that happen before? Watch this. EXP of 20. There's a number. EXP of 30. How about 40? There. <laughs> right? Uh, 100. Hey, look at that. It actually works pretty well. EXP is a lot more stable than, say, uh, 300? Anyway, you can see where I'm going with this, right? We quickly run out of digits. Um, EXP is a little bit more stable than uh, the inverse normal function, but it's still a little bit of a problem. So this range is reduced. Okay, you wanna see some results? I will not run these in front of you because it actually takes longer to do. The other thing I wish should note is I had a longer warm up, warm up and more sampling iterations. And I did that because using a Bernoulli distribution, there's less information in the distribution. It's harder for convergence to be achieved. It takes longer warm up usually. It takes a little bit longer iterations of chains to get a good sample of your posterior distribution. All right, here's our results. Let's take a look at lambda. First of all, everything converged, all right? Hooray, r hat, close to one, the maximum. The maximum value is 1.002. That's good convergence. However, have you ever seen an item discrimination of 21.7 before? We have one. You know why we have one. <laughs> this item, item eight, I think has the smallest proportion of people who would endorse the item. So we get two things happening here. Number one, it's heavily related to the trait because there's not a lot of people endorsing anything. So if you endorse an item, you're more likely to endorse this one too. But second, um, it's just really hard to estimate. Look at the item intercept for it. Now the intercept, again, that's the expected value of the logit when theta is zero. So the probability of entering or endorsing this item for a person with zero theta is virtually zero, right? If we have a, a person with a theta one standard deviation higher than that, or one, it's still most likely zero, right? It takes you multiple standard deviations to get to where that would be. Which makes sense, item eight was the NAFTA superhighway. It's called I-35, duh, anyway. Doesn't I-35 run from like Canada down to Texas or something like that? I-5 in the West Coast, all right. All right, so I'm gonna look at these item parameters, but remember, technically we should be looking at model fit first, but I just wanna, I'll put in model fit at the end. The item parameters, we could actually calculate something called the item characteristic curve. Turns out, for us, we can draw an item characteristic curve for every iteration of our posterior sample. So this is item five, you'll see that the red line is the item characteristic curve at the EAP estimates of our mu and lambda parameters. The other thing I want to note to you, this is the same logit that you're used to in the two parameter logit model. It's just the parameterization is sloped intercept, not discrimination difficulty. So you can still calculate it. And the data scale, it's still basically the same. There will be very little difference in the probabilities between the two parameterizations. But look at how much wiggle room there is around where that is. Remember, the, the uh, well, when we get to the next parameterization, we'll see that the 50-50 um, the, the, the part of this is where the, dis uh, the difficulty of the item is. For us, when theta is zero, this right here is the wiggle in the, in the, um, in the item intercept, right? It's 
very small. Here's our item parameter trace plots. Take a look at, <laughs> have you ever seen logits that go like to negative 50? It's difficult. These are rare, rare response items. I know we're out of time here. Here's some more item parameters. How about we stop here? Thank you for your attention today. Thank you for everybody joining online. I hope this was entertaining. Sorry. Educational. And I uh, hope to see you next week. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.